Did you know? Hideo Kojima wanted to let players keep rats as pets in Metal Gear Solid. Rats play a small but significant role in the game's final build, like following them through air ducts and finding one that ate a key. But according to Kojima, he originally wanted them to play an even bigger role. He said the rats were a way of adding reality to the game and to create the atmosphere within the base. The enemy soldiers eat food and they have leftovers which attracts the rats. I actually wanted to put more rats in. Another thing I wanted to do was reassign names to individual rats, and these rats could then be raised as pets. Alaska is a very cold place, and when Snake first goes into the base, the rats are the first life forms he encounters. So I think they're a very important element in the game. When Snake returns to Shadow Moses nine years later in Metal Gear Solid 4, there's an optional codec conversation where Snake refers to the rats as his friends, which leaves Otacon thoroughly confused. Ostensibly, Snake says they're his friends because they helped him through the vents nine years earlier, but it may also have been a nod to the fact that Snake was originally meant to keep them as pets. There was also a rat-based Easter egg in the shootout with Sniper Wolf. According to Kojima, in that scene initially I had this little cheat in there where if you kept shooting the rats you'd get bigger and bigger rats. It was in there for a while but then I felt like it was too much of a joke so I took it out. But in the final game, instead of the rats growing, there's a secret where Colonel Campbell calls and tells you to stop shooting them and get back to the mission. And if you ignore his orders, Naomi calls and says you must be pretty sick to torture small animals. Kojima also said his favorite scene is the jeep escape, although it was originally planned to be a bit different and would let players choose between the driver's seat and the gun on the back. It didn't work out though, so in the game's final build, Snake only shoots. All three of these stories come from a four-page interview published in the May 1999 issue of Computer and Video Games Magazine. These are just a few examples of cut content from the series, but Kojima once said he could only get about 60% of his ideas in Metal Gear Solid, and had to abandon lots more throughout the entire series. So, to learn about them all, Did You Know Gaming dug through about 800 retro magazines looking for interviews, sifted through various documents, and conducted a few exclusive interviews interviews with developers, so sit back, grab some rations, and check out the strangest and most ambitious ideas that never made it into the Metal Gear series. One cut idea was a singing mariachi who advised Snake on battle tactics. In the May 99 issue of official UK PlayStation magazine, an interviewer asked Kojima about cut content and he told them, there was another character, Mariachi. He was an analyst and every time you fight you were supposed to talk to this guy and he'd tell you the best way to defeat your enemy. And every time you asked for this guy, he sang a song. The song was in Spanish, like with a flamenco guitar. It was ridiculous. And he laughed. And a year later he told Edge magazine, he knew a lot about mercenaries and you could contact him through the codec. He'd give you information about a particular mercenary, but only after he sang a song, and you'd have to sit through the entire song before he'd give the information. He didn't make it into the game. When Snake lands on Shadow Moses, he only has two items in his possession, a scope and a pack of cigarettes. Snake's cigarettes were somewhat controversial, but Konami was cool with it because smoking drains your health, which let players know smoking's bad for you. The game also features a lung cancer warning, although Snake brushes it off because cigarettes taste good. But besides looking cool, smoking only comes in useful once in the entire game, letting you blow smoke on invisible lasers so you can sneak past them. However, in the very first issue of Arcade Magazine, Kojima explained that he actually wanted to add more incentives for Snake to light up, saying, We were planning to include more of the cigarettes in the gameplay. For example, at one point you would be stuck in a cell with no way out. The trick would be to befriend the guard by giving him a cigarette, but this idea didn't make it into the final game. When the series made the jump to PlayStation 2, despite the upgrade in hardware, Kojima said his unlimited desire to create still surpassed what the PS2 was capable of, and some ideas had to be thrown out. One of the more interesting mechanics was real-time whisker shaving, where your facial hair would grow based on the PS2's internal clock, and you could choose between shaving or letting it grow out naturally. But, real-time facial hair ultimately got cut and replaced with a couple easter eggs instead. In the final build, the shaver's pretty useless, and it's easy to miss and finish the game without it. But, if you manage to find the shaver early on, Raiden gives it to Snake in the cutscene when they first meet. Snake usually has whiskers when you see him later, but he'll appear clean-shaven if you gave him the shaver, and his whiskers will actually grow back one week later, as tracked by the PS2's internal clock, which is reflected in codec calls as well as his in-game model. During Metal Gear Solid 4's development, Kojima said he'd try to bring back real-time whisker shaving, but in the end, the mechanic never found its way into the series at all. Kojima is famous for playing mind tricks on his fans, but one of those tricks got removed from MGS2 because even the developers were getting confused. According to Kojima, the original cell phone only vibrated and didn't ring. I wanted to fool the player by making him think he was incurring damage when actually all that was happening was that the phone was ringing. But then, so many of our staff who didn't know about the cell phone making the controller vibrate thought the vibration was a bug. That's why we added a ringing sound. In all the international versions, the ringtone sounds like this. 
but the Japanese version got an exclusive MGS theme chiptune ringtone. The FAMAS assault rifle was iconic in the original Metal Gear Solid, but its inclusion kind of didn't make sense since it's a type of gun almost exclusively used by French soldiers and not American special forces, or Russians either for that matter. The FAMAS was originally planned for the sequel as well, and Snake can be seen with it in early trailers, but Kojima was pressured to remove it for realism purposes. In an interview with EGM, he said, The game was first developed with the FAMAS, but we turned it into the M4 to be consistent with the story. Graphics supervisor Yoji Shinkawa and others who know a lot about guns begged us to drop the FAMAS. We had to drop all the polygon models and character motions involving the FAMAS as a result. What a waste. Fortunately, it wasn't a complete waste. Since it was cut so late in development, the FAMAS can still be found in MGS2's Trial Edition, a demo bundled with Zone of the Enders, also produced by Kojima. With a cheat code, you can still unlock it and use it throughout the entire demo. In that same interview, Kojima goes on to say that there were at least four more items scrapped in MGS2's development, like the SPP-1M underwater pistol, a real-life gun developed by the Soviet Union in the 1960s, which held four bullets and had an effective range of about 50 feet firing underwater. Data for this underwater pistol can still be found in an early demo of the Trial Edition. You can actually use the SPP-1M with hacks, but the gun was never rendered, so it's invisible. Kojima also said X-ray goggles were cut, which presumably would have let you see through enemies in walls. There was also the decoy balloon, which eventually made its way into Metal Gear Solid V. Kojima also mentioned a penguin suit, which actually had some concept art made public, with a Japanese caption that says, Antarctic Snake. The way it's written, it's clearly a reference to Antarctic Adventure, a 1983 game made by Konami, where you race a penguin to far-flung research stations all around Antarctica. Its sequel, Penguin Adventure, released three years later and was the first game Kojima ever worked on. Penguin suit concept art was included in The Document of Metal Gear Solid 2, an interactive making-of documentary released a year after the game itself. The document also includes these experimental 3D models for Snake and Mei Ling, along with four characters who got cut out entirely, like China a man, a boss who, despite being Vietnamese, brags that he's, quote, more Chinese than the Chinese. He was sold as a child to a New Yorker, then grew up getting discriminated against, so he seeks revenge on New York and America in general. According to Kojima, China Man would have had a dragon tattoo that came to life when he dove into water, and part of the boss battle would have taken place underwater, with China Man sending sharks after you. He ended up getting cut when Kojima's team ran out of time, although he later appeared in the official MGS2 comic book adaptation, along with another cut character named Old Boy. Old Boy's over 100 years old and fought for the Germans in World War II, and taught Big Boss everything he knows about the art of combat. Piranhas and boss battles against the President's security team and Great White Sharks were also mentioned in the document, but didn't appear in the final game. And a couple more cut characters who weren't quite as fleshed out. A girl named Max, who saved your game and loved to quote William Shakespeare and Doc, a scientist who developed Arsenal Gear's AI and provided radio support. Both would eventually be exposed as AI constructs, just like the Colonel. But the most interesting part of the document is Kojima's original vision for MGS2, which he called the Grand Game Plan. About 90% of the plan made it into the final game, but the remaining 10% got scrapped. It features some interesting unused ideas, like that Kojima originally wanted to call it Metal Gear Solid 3, which would symbolize the three tallest skyscrapers in New York City and stir up buzz as fans would wonder what happened to Metal Gear Solid 2. The document also boasts of doing something that's never been done in a video game before. Real-time split-screen cutscenes, where half the screen shows a cinematic while the player continues playing the game on the other half. The grand game plan says there would have been three of them. The bomb disposal sequence with Raiden, Snake, and Peter Stillman. The sniper sequence surrounding Emma's rescue. And dismantling the C4 in the underwater strut. After examining titles that succeeded in America, Kojima said it was essential they include a multiplayer mode, where two players could either gun each other down or engage in a stealth-driven game of hide-and-seek. There was also going to be a Mantis mode for repeat playthroughs of the main campaign. By wearing the Mantis mask, you could hear the inner thoughts of NPCs to tell when they were lying and better understand the game's complicated plot. There's also a scrapped location that was going to be at the bottom of the offshore plant surrounded by glass walls, and players could casually observe marine life, virtually explore the ocean floor with a remote-controlled mini-sub, and take pictures of what they saw. But this had no bearing on anything else in the game. 
Possibly the biggest change was Kojima's vision for MGS2's beginning and ending. The document explains in great detail how the first act begins with Iraq being suspected of developing their own Metal Gear, which prompts the United Nations to demand access for nuclear inspections. But Iraq refuses, so the US responds by threatening airstrikes. The final act would have seen a battle on Wall Street and half the financial district destroyed. But all of these plot points started to sound a bit too similar to what was happening in the real world during the game's development, particularly the 9-11 attacks so the story was changed to avoid controversy. Not long after MGS2 hit store shelves, Kojima and his mentor Shigeru Miyamoto decided to bring the series to GameCube. Kojima's team was too busy to do it themselves, so they pitched it to Silicon Knights president Dennis Dyack. Silicon Knights had just finished Eternal Darkness, a critically acclaimed psychological horror published by Nintendo. Together, the three of them set out to remake the original Metal Gear Solid, beefed up with enhancements introduced in the sequel. In 2004, it released as Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes. Mid-development, the game was announced to have a GameCube to GBA connectivity, but none of those features made it into the final game. When asked about it later, Dayak said, We had some really interesting concepts and some co-op mode play ideas. For example, you could have a special radar on the GBA. You could have some kind of spy camera that you could, say, drop down and monitor a certain area for guards. There were all kinds of things we talked about, but at the end of the day, we just looked at the amount of resources and time it would take, and unfortunately, we just couldn't do it. Unable to find any more details in old magazines, now almost 20 years later, Did You Know Gaming tracked down Dennis Dyack to ask how those features might have worked. Dyack said they were tinkering with the idea of giving Snake a camera that you could leave in a room or drive around on wheels and monitor the video feed on GBA. As far as co-op, the second player's primary purpose would have been aiding Snake indirectly, kind of like how Tingle did in The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, providing stuff like items and info. That's about all he remembered. So Did You Know Gaming decided to get in contact with Twin Snake's project leader, Carrie Murray. He said they also wanted to give players the option of having codec calls and the map on GBA. It could have saved players from fumbling in menus and stopping and starting so much, but Silicon Knights just didn't have enough time or manpower to implement it before release date. Murray's team had a lot of ideas they would have liked to have added in, but the budget and deadline were set. And because there were three major stakeholders, Konami, Nintendo, and Silicon Knights, no single entity had the authority to call for a delay or allocate more funds. They had exactly Exactly the amount of resources required for the job they were given, remaking MGS1 with the features of MGS2. But everyone involved, including Kojima and Miyamoto, did have a few more ideas they would have loved to have squeezed in. Eternal Darkness's main draw was its sanity effects, like tricking the player into thinking their TV was on the fritz, or that they got duped into buying a demo and not the full game. One of the team's main priorities was giving some of these abilities to Psycho Mantis, but they just didn't have the resources. Did You Know Gaming asked if there had ever been any intention to add VR missions into Twin Snakes, and Murray said, I think there was some talk about VR missions. That probably would have come first, before GBA connectivity, but VR was a lower priority as well. I think the way that worked was, well, let's see if we have any bandwidth towards the end and we can hook that up later. And we might have even started working on VR, but we didn't have time for that either, so we had to ship the game without the feature. He also said they wanted to add a split-screen mode where a second player took the role of a boss. The example he gave was Sniper Wolf, and they duke it out with Snake, like the versus mode Kojima wanted in MGS too. But multiplayer would have required even more resources than their other ideas, so ultimately, they had no choice but to give up on that one as well. Now, let's move on to Metal Gear Solid 3. The first game was on PS1, the second on PS2, and Kojima originally wanted to develop the third for PS3. He waited and waited for Sony to release their next generation console, but it took so long that he couldn't wait any longer and eventually settled for PlayStation 2. In the end, he said there were hundreds of ideas he couldn't fit into the game, many of them because there just wasn't enough space. A PS3 dual-layer Blu-ray holds 50 gigabytes, but a PS2 single-layer disc can't even hold 5 gigs, and the lack of storage meant Kojima had to make some cuts. He said, We overflowed the confines of a DVD and had to cut tons of stuff in order to squeeze it onto the disc. We had to get rid of a few cutscenes simply because there wasn't room. We also had to get rid of several radio stations, codec frequencies dedicated to music. Some of these secret stations are still in the game, but we had to cut a lot of the tunes that we'd recorded for them. One of the few stations to survive in the final game was Healing Radio, a frequency that plays pleasant tunes that replenish your stamina. We wanted to make a station that would be the reverse of this, tunes so bad that they lower 
lower your stamina. We planned to sing the songs ourselves, but that never happened. We were just going to take turns butchering the Snake Eater opening theme karaoke style, but we simply didn't have room. Several other ideas ended up getting cut, like two bosses Kojima described as a lizard man and a moss guy. He even said they wanted to implement functionality with the PS2 eye toy. Kojima never specified, but the eye toy might have been meant for making custom camouflage. When the game was ported to the Nintendo 3DS eight years later, they added the camouflage photography system, which let you take pictures of stuff in the real world and turn them into Snake's camo. But his team wasn't just short on space, they were also running short on time, and just barely managed to release the game one week before Black Friday, the state's biggest shopping day of the year. Unlike the previous two games, Metal Gear 3 didn't have a Soliton radar to track your enemies, because the tech didn't exist back in the 60s. If he'd had more time, Kojima said he would have liked to have designed another game mode that did have a radar, but without making the game too easy. Some interesting camouflage mechanics also got scrapped, like being able to paint Snake's face manually any way you like, but they couldn't get the controls to feel natural and replace the mechanic with preset templates. During development, Kojima also said they'd made over 100 camo patterns, but only half of them made it onto the final game. One he talked about on several occasions was the bloody camo, which was covered in blood and fake wounds, so if you lied next to some dead bodies, enemy soldiers would think Snake was dead too and leave him alone. This camo got cut from Metal Gear 3, but was brought back as the corpse camo in the next game. We don't want to dwell too long on portable ops, because despite having Solid in its title, it wasn't directed by Kojima himself, and he said it wasn't entirely part of the core series canon. But Kojima did mention one interesting idea in early 2006, while Portable Ops and Metal Gear Solid 4 were both still in development. In an interview with EGM, he said he wanted to let players move their teams back and forth between Portable Ops and MGS4's online mode, but he seems to indicate the gap in release dates was going to make it difficult to implement the level of connectivity between games. It's not it's not entirely clear how that would have worked, but that might be because Metal Gear Solid 4's premise changed pretty dramatically during development, and in that sense, you could argue MGS4 has more scrapped ideas than any other game in the series. In early 2006, Kojima explained the MGS4's premise to EGM. Here, he said how the player could take several different approaches to completing missions that would have a deep impact on the game's story. If players chose to team up with Country C and went into battle where Countries A and B were fighting, they might prefer to sneak in then flee unnoticed. But if the player got spotted by Country A or B, you'll have to fight them, or both countries if they spot you. You could even team up with a country if what you needed was in their territory, but that would mean becoming their ally and by default, the enemy of another country. Or you could just wait until the war's over and grab what you need after. Or you could destroy a country's forces in the current mission, and with no army, the conflict would simply not exist in the next. In Kojima's words, So, the new thing is that Snake will definitely have to go to the battlefield, and he will have the opportunity to interfere with the war, and that interference will affect the next stages. This is the new plot. Later that year, he told official PlayStation Magazine, you may decide to stick with Nation A or B in the game's war, or you could destroy both. You could also choose not to ally with either country. In the game's final build, Snake could help out the rebels and engage in a little trading, but he could never ally with the PMCs, and the overall premise of playing off countries A, B, and C was left almost entirely on the cutting room floor. Kojima also wanted civilians to play a larger role on the battlefield, maybe taking up arms to protect their families, but that idea got scrapped as well. It seems MGS4 was originally planned as an entirely different kind of game, and lost some of its bigger ideas during its lengthy development. Even the ending turned out different. At TGS 2007, Kojima said, One of my ideas for MGS4's ending was that since Snake and Otacon are breaking the law in order to fulfill their justice, I was thinking of having them turn themselves in, and for the sake of justice they'd get convicted and executed by the law. But all of my staff went against the idea, so I decided not to go with that. The ending they went with instead was after Big Boss dies at the boss's grave. Snake decides to spend what little time he has left living in peace. Even though a PS3 Blu-ray could hold 50 gigs of storage, Kojima still couldn't fit everything he wanted into Metal Gear Solid 4. He originally planned to include both the English and Japanese language tracks on both versions of the game so fans could listen to the one they liked best, but had to settle for one language per disc. He told Famitsu, For us, we're still not satisfied with the quality we can do. You know, there's not capacity space. There's not enough space at all and he laughed. We always talked about where to cut and what to compress, but there's actually some voice recording still on the disc that got dummied out, which indicates Snake was originally planned to have access to a lot more of Shadow Moses than what got used in the game. Like this cut codec call that would have taken place in the woman's restroom. You're in a lady's room for Pete's sake. Why would any guy be in there reminiscing unless he was some kind of... <sighs> Look, 
This is where Meryl and I first really talked. Another codec call reveals Snake would have had access to the Wolf Dog Cave, the Calm Towers, and presumably the areas in between, and maybe some other parts of the island as well. Behind the bookcase, there's a door hidden back there. Oh, the one you were talking about upstairs. It leads to the cave where the Wolf Dogs lived. There were also a few cut characters revealed in the Japan-exclusive Metal Gear Solid 4 Master Artworks collection, like a Russian soldier named Adam. Did you know gaming had his description translated, and it says the Russian military was originally meant to get involved in the fighting, but the story got too complicated so the character got axed. This likely ties back into the game's original concept focused on countries A, B, and C. Adam might have had something to do with Ocelot, whose real name is Adamska. Ocelot's also half Russian, but there's not enough information on record to know if there's any connection. Johnny Sasaki was the soldier guarding Snake's cell in Metal Gear 3, and it's his grandson who marries Meryl towards the end of Metal Gear Solid 4. Grandpa Johnny was initially planned to attend his grandson's wedding, but didn't make it in. And the last cut character was Snake Man, whom we don't get much information about, except that he gets his name from the tentacles coming out of his Solidus-like suit. When Metal Gear Solid 4 hit store shelves, many fans noticed that the series' main musical theme, the one you're hearing now, was noticeably absent from the game's soundtrack. According to the game's composer, Norihiko Hibino, that's because Konami faced legal problems after some Russians claimed the series' theme was plagiarized, stolen from a Soviet composer that, interestingly enough, composed it for a 1964 film called Metal. The Metal Gear team denied the plagiarism accusations, but the suits at Konami didn't want to mess with the Russians, so the musical motif Motif was absent not only from MGS4, but also removed from Portable Ops. In fact, it was even cut from Super Smash Bros. Brawl, where leftover code reveals the MGS main theme was once planned for that game as well. Finally, we can leave all that in San Geronimo behind. Moving on to the next game in the series, Peace Walker. Might not have been a numbered sequel, but according to Kojima Productions, it's as mainline as it gets. And it was originally planned to be revealed at E3 2009 as Metal Gear Solid 5 Peace Walker. But the number 5 ended up getting cut simply due to it being a handheld game. Instead of the usual linear adventure, Peace Walker's made up of 153 independent missions, but hiding in the original data is 24 extra ops that go unused, but are still playable with hacks. They generally have the same objectives as many other extra ops, like extracting prisoners with Fulton recovery, demolishing targets with C4, and eliminating all enemy soldiers in a given area. These 24 unused ops would have boosted the total mission count by 15%, but for whatever reason, they got cut. The final game has four AI weapons, the Pupa, Chrysalis, Cocoon, and Peace Walker. But the Peace Walker official artworks collection reveals four earlier AIs that got scrapped in development. Did You Know Gaming translated the notes written by concept artist Chihoko Uchiyama, who says there was originally supposed to be one AI weapon each for land, air, sea, as well as the Peace Walker, and they were all named after women from classic fiction. The land weapon was named after Belle from Beauty and the Beast, and Uchiyama says it's based on a real-life Sphinx tank. The water weapon was Odette, named for the princess in the Russian ballet Swan Lake. It's based on a Nautilus submarine, although its appearance would have stayed hidden under the surface. The air weapon was named after Scarlet in Gone with the Wind, and looked like a mix between a YB flying wind and a B2 stealth bomber. And Sleeping Beauty was the Peace Walker. It was meant to be the Patriot's ultimate AI, but kept on sleeping after its completion. This next slice of Peace Walker cut content is really more of a case of censorship, which only occurred in the Japanese version. According to Kojima, the PSP is supported by the younger generation. That is why we avoided the animation of Blood Spill. However, a scene that's critical and essential to the series was pointed out by the rating board. He's talking about the torture scene in Mission 20, which would have knocked the game up to a D rating by the Japanese rating board, which is equivalent to M for mature. But dialogue tweaks and changing the electric torture to tickling torture meant Konami secured the less restrictive C rating. Here's the scene as it appeared in every country except Japan. And here's the same scene in Japan, censored. There actually is historical record of tickle torture being used in Japan, but it was pretty rare and mostly reserved for women. Historical precedent or not, Kojima wasn't too happy having his art censored in his own country, saying, There's tolerance for fantasy games, but for games where you show war or real violence between people, you apparently can't complain about anything. With this, it seems impossible to communicate something meaningful through games. And now we arrive at the franchise finale. 
Metal Gear Solid V. As Kojima's relationship with Konami grew increasingly strained, he ultimately left the company just one month after the game hit store shelves. In early 2015, Kojima said fans were going to complain that MGS5 was too big to complete, but his sudden departure later that year, along with the game's abrupt ending and copy-pasted mission structure in the late game, left a lot of fans feeling it was released unfinished. But it's unclear just how much content got cut because of Kojima's falling out with Konami, and how much was scrapped for the same reasons all his games released with lots of unused ideas. Kojima hasn't fully clarified, so whether or not MGS5 was actually unfinished remains controversial even to this day. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. To be fair, some content appears to have been cut for artistic reasons. A good chunk of the game gets spent watching the gradual construction of the Battle Gear, because it was originally planned as a buddy similar to Quiet and D-Dog, as evidenced by the game's internal data. But in the game's final build, it was relegated to a much smaller role. According to Kojima, the Battle Gear created by Emmerich is used in the combat deployment missions, and to be honest, my plan was to make it available on the actual field. But I noticed that its presence disrupted the gameplay balance during first test sessions, so I eventually had to remove it from the game. Concept art for an older version of Chico can be found in the game's art book, revealing how he would have appeared in Phantom Pain, severely disfigured from the helicopter crash at the end of Ground Zeroes. An early script leaked online says Chico survived the crash and ended up in Zaire, and at some point Amanda would ask Snake to go kill him. Combined with this concept art of the buddy system, some fans think that in a similar sequence of events as Quiet, there would have been a boss fight against Chico, that he'd join Snake as a buddy. But the authenticity of that leaked script can't be confirmed, or if it's really even Chico in that buddy concept art. So take that last part with a grain of salt. Regardless, it appears Chico was written out of Phantom Pain voluntarily and never made it out of the concept phase. But there was also a lot of content that looks to have been cut involuntarily. The bonus disc bundled with the collector's edition featured a 20-minute video showing off the Kingdom of the Flies, a scrapped 51st mission with 30% of its cutscenes completed. Mission 51 would have tied up some loose story threads, especially for Eli, and despite not making it into the final game, is still considered canon since it's included in Phantom Pain's endgame timeline. Kojima's biggest undelivered promise probably has to be the return to Camp Omega, the military base where Ground Zeroes takes place. In a 2014 interview with Jeff Keighley, Kojima said, People who own Ground Zeroes will be able to play a different mission at Camp Omega in the Phantom Pain. That's the current plan. There's something of a big feature involved. It's never been done in the games industry before, so I can't go into detail about it. But I think when you experience it for yourselves, you'll be surprised. It's something that's only possible through video games. There are still traces of Camp Omega and Phantom Pain's internal data, but the game never actually takes you there. Data mining also reveals this unused title card for Chapter 3. Peace. Some fans believe Chapter 3, Peace, would have added tons of new missions and plot points, but others think it was never meant as anything more than an ending title card. Like how after the last story mission in Death Stranding, a title card for Episode 15, Tomorrow is in Your Hands, appears on screen, letting the player know they've finished the story, while still allowing them to run around the sandbox and complete special deliveries. Whatever Chapter 3 actually is, Konami's been hinting for years that nuclear disarmament in MGS5 Online is the key to unlocking it. Several groups have sprung up over the years to try and steal everyone else's nukes and attain peace, but so far their efforts have been in vain. Disarmament was originally going to be covered in this video, but the deeper the rabbit hole got, the more truly wild info did you know gaming unearthed, and the full story grew well outside the bounds of this video. So, look out a few weeks from now for the seven-year story of nuclear abolition, what it could mean for the single-player campaign, and how Konami rigged it all from the very beginning. Did you know, in Metal Gear Solid 3, the scene where Volgan tortures Snake was meant to be interactive and a lot more violent? This is, of course, the moment Snake loses his right eye. In the game's final build, it's a one-minute cutscene the player just watches passively, while Colonel Volgan electrocutes and punches Snake to find out how much the CIA knows about him. But, in a director's commentary published in a 2005 magazine, Kojima said that the whole thing was going to go on much longer. Eventually, we ended up cutting that back, we were also going to have an option as Snake was being tortured to have the player choose either yes or no when Volgan commanded him to speak or break. But we ended up removing this feature because of things going on in the real world. We had to tone things down in terms of violence. What was happening in the real world were the headlines about the CIA and all the things they've been doing to acquire information from their enemies. So Kojima decided it was best to cut the scene down to its bare essentials. I'm David Hayter. A few months ago, I hosted a video on this channel detailing content cut from the Metal Gear series, and today, we're going to look at even more. 
Did you know gaming searched through thousands of magazines from all over the world looking for old interviews, archive footage, and combed through countless Kojima tweets so they could dig up even more ideas that for one reason or another didn't make the final cut? Some were victims of censorship, others got axed due to hardware specs, and in some instances, the discs just couldn't fit all of the content they'd already created. Like in the original Metal Gear Solid, it came with 30 virtual reality missions available on the start menu, but Kojima's team actually created about 60 missions. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough room left on the disc to squeeze them all in. A year later, they released an expansion disc with 300 VR missions, but Kojima originally wanted it to be 10 times bigger, and hundreds of missions that were already fully completed ended up getting cut. In the Metal Gear Solid Integral Strategy Guide, he said, We originally talked about 3,000. How many was it we ended up making? Including the ones we cut. Then the VR director tells him about 500, I believe. We had a lot of free time when we were working on the European version, so we spent half of our time just playing around with the game. Then Kojima said, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but we just messed around with the original game while working on the other versions. We eventually started making new VR stages during our spare time, and before we knew it, we had a whole new set of them. So, I gave a presentation about it to my superiors where I said to them, I have a confession to make. This is what we've been doing all this time. They didn't look too happy about that, but they admitted it wasn't such a bad idea. And they then asked us to make it into a proper game. They go on to say they made a lot more mystery mode missions, but scrapped the most difficult ones, leaving only 10 on the disc. In another interview, Kojima said they wanted to add a versus mode, sort of a stealth game of hide and seek, but ultimately gave up on the idea. The game was already way behind schedule. Kojima told his superiors that Metal Gear Solid would only take a year to make, but active development dragged on for almost three years. And besides, even if they'd had all the time in the world, the disc was already packed to the brim. Metal Gear Solid was released in Japan, North America, and Europe, and became a bigger hit than I could have imagined. I was extremely pleased with its success, but I soon started to hear requests for a sequel wherever I went. I was planning to create a completely new game at the time, but I couldn't escape my fate. I would have to direct the sequel. After committing to Metal Gear Solid 2, Kojima dreamt up some ambitious ideas to make it bigger than the first game, but only half of them made it into the final release. Even the game's opening moments got cut. Sons of Liberty blew everyone's minds when it was revealed at E3 2000, and magazine interviewers flooded Kojima, all trying to get their 15 minutes with the man. In a few of those interviews, he said AI would study your actions during the first few minutes of gameplay, then use that data to detect your age, gender, and personal interests. Different people would receive a different experience for the rest of the game, like how much blood, gore, and graphic content it would expose you to. Presumably, that meant a grown man would have a more M-rated adventure than a preteen would get. But even at its big reveal party, Kojima was already saying the PS2 wasn't powerful enough to realize all his grand ambitions, and some journalists suspected the AI opening was one of the ideas that wouldn't make the final cut. They were right. The closest thing that made it in was just directly asking the player for their info, which only affected the ending. The data appears on Raiden's dog tags, then he throws them away, discarding the identity of the player so he can form his own identity. Talking to the official Czech PlayStation magazine, Kojima said they were considering ideas to make use of PS2's internet functionality and that Sons of Liberty probably would make use of them. He went into more detail a few months later, saying, We do have plans for internet features, but it's really up to Sony to realize these network systems. The first, basic step would be to implement a system whereby players could exchange weapons via the internet. My favorite idea is to have an AI program, or even a real person, to play Colonel Campbell or Mei Ling. They would monitor everyone playing the game, see how well or badly they're doing, and start giving advice on how to proceed in the game. They could even give tips on life and answer all kinds of questions. Obviously, our programmers are the ones who create the algorithms of the enemies and boss characters, so it would be fun if they could actually control these characters in real time and fight the player. Talking more to the Czechs, Kojima said he also hoped to incorporate voice recognition. The magazine mentioned that Sony was working on that technology for PS2. Kojima was well aware of that fact, saying, Yes, I would like to incorporate voice recognition technology into my game. For example, it would fit perfectly into Metal Gear. It would be enough to shout a command. A PS2 stealth game, SOCOM, later came packaged with a headset. You could play online and talk to your squad mates, or you could play offline and issue commands to AI companions. But it sounds like Kojima had something different in mind. 
Instead of directing teammates, players would control Raiden with their voices. Kojima had actually been talking about using voice in place of buttons since he finished MGS1. He lamented that controllers had too many buttons, and too many actions had to be assigned to each one. It was confusing, but more importantly, it wasn't immersive. He explained, I don't want the game control to be too complex. Because it is an action game, I wanted it to be intuitive. In RPGs, you press a button and a window opens and you can choose an item. But I wanted to avoid this. Just one click activates some action. As a result, we ended up using every button on the controller, but once you get used to it, then it will be convenient. However, I do think there are too many buttons with current controllers making the gameplay difficult. Eventually, I would like to see a voice recognition controller to make things easier. Maybe he would have had us talking to our TVs, saying things like spray or answer the call. But we like to think Kojima's a bit more imaginative than that. He was aware that many fans had issues with the button mashing torture scenes, so perhaps some kind of verbal response could have replaced them. Or talking out loud can take the player through different dialogue trees. That said, the only specific function Kojima described was in an interview with Australian magazine Hyper about how players could say a character's name and the codec would call them hands-free. Kojima also mentioned an item that would have essentially needed four times the power of the PS2. He said, In the initial stages of development, we invent the most outrageous weapons and items for the player to use. Unfortunately, many of them either take up too much of the console's processing power, or they ruin the game balance, so we end up weeding them out. We're playing with a great feature now that I fear is likely to be taken out of the final version. It involves being able to place your own surveillance cameras at certain spots in the game and view them remotely. You have four extra screens, but that means four times the processing. Unfortunately, he was right. The cameras didn't make it in, and even adding reflective surfaces forced Kojima to reduce polygon counts for characters and environments. At the next year's E3, just a few months before launch, MGS2's trailer ended with a classic, one more thing. The spectacle of a flood ripping through the tanker as Snake sprinted to stay ahead of it. But when fans finally got their hands on the long-awaited sequel, that entire sequence was notably missing. Kojima later explained the cut. Piper asked if he achieved 100% of what he wanted, and he told them, I was not able to do even half of what I wanted to do. Since this is an action game, I had to avoid designing situations which would result in any slowdown due to the PS2's processing speed. The PS2 is not the magic box. There was an event in the game in which you would try to move yourself through a flood. We really tried to include it in the game, but it ended up being dropped. He cut the flood escape at the last minute, but it still made it in as a cutscene. When Olga reveals her backstory and motivations to Raiden, you can see it in a flashback. There was going to be another sequence on the tanker where Snake swims underwater surrounded by sharks, and Snake would have to spill his blood in the right places to distract them so he could escape before drowning. Kojima describes several other sequences with sharks, including a boss battle against a great white, but in the end, not even one shark made it into the final game. A few months after launch, series artist Yoji Shinkawa published an MGS2 art book, which was promoted with a lengthy online interview. Talking about an unused Antarctic snake design, Shinkawa said it was going to be a penguin suit that lets snake breathe underwater. But transforming it from a concept into an in-game item would have been extra work that wouldn't have been worth it. Presumably, it would have come in handy in all those underwater shark and flood sequences. In our last video, we talked about a few cut characters, like Old Boy and Chinaman. But we missed one shown in this art book, Ed from the NYPD Bomb Squad. According to Shinkawa, it's actually Ed Brown from Police Knots, a game he and Kojima made for 3DO. In Police Knots, Ed's part of the LAPD sometime around 2013, but later becomes chief of the Space Colony's vice unit. Meryl Silverberg got her start in Police Knots 2 as Ed's subordinate in the vice unit. So moving Ed into the Metal Gear universe would continue the tradition. MGS2 would have shown Ed Brown in his younger days, in the NYPD's bomb squad, but that'd mean him dying a few years before the events in Police Knots, possibly creating some sort of time paradox. So he got replaced with Peter Stillman. There were also a few scenes left out, mostly for being a little too weird. In the final game, there's a soldier who can't hold his bladder any longer and pees over a fence, not realizing that he's soaking Raiden. The Colonel and Rose call to express their sympathies and tell Raiden to take a shower when the mission's over. On a Japanese talk show, Kojima said he wanted to add another scene to go along with it. This time, a guard backs up to a fence with his butt out, making the player think, Oh God, is this guy about to blow mud all over me? But then, to their surprise, they just get peed on again. Kojima thought it was hilarious, but none of his developers would make it for him. They all pretended to be too busy. There was another scene he wanted to include right at the beginning, the first time Snake enters the tanker. 
As you walk down the corridor, you hear the suspense building violin music from the movie Psycho. The violin sounds get louder and louder as you approach a door, making you think something terrifying is about to happen. When you open the door, bracing yourself for the worst, you find a guard playing the violin. It's just a gag, but it costs too much to buy a violin and do motion capture for it so the scene didn't get made. On the game's 20th anniversary, Kojima tweeted out some memories of what it was like behind the scenes. In a codec call with Rose, Raiden reveals that he was raised as a child soldier and fought in Liberia's civil war, and was shown Hollywood movies for image training. Kojima acquired real-life footage of a child soldier to use in the game and edited it himself, but the footage was rejected by the ratings board and had to be cut. In another tweet, Kojima said there was one more sequence that pushed things a little too far and had to get dialed back. Right after Raiden reveals his dark childhood, he has to run through Arsenal gear naked. The whole time, he's been using his hands to hide his baby maker. But originally, if you fumbled in combat, then what should not be seen would be seen, and you'd immediately get a game over. But the biggest thing that almost got cut was not Raiden's penis. It was the entire game. In our last video, we talked about how large sections of the story were changed last minute because of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The original plot began with weapons inspections in Iraq and ended with half of New York's financial district getting destroyed. But after 9-11 happened, MGS2 was deemed too close to reality, and the story was revised to avoid controversy. Shortly after our video was published, more details came to light, thanks to the translation work of the Kojima archivist. In 2005, the Snake Eater Extreme box set was released in Japan, which included a behind-the-scenes book called The Shedding. Several pages are dedicated to 9-11 from Kojima's perspective, and how instead of making revisions, he originally wanted to cancel the game completely. In September 2001, development was pretty much finished, and two million Americans had already placed pre-orders. Then a staff member came to Kojima and shouted that something had crashed into the World Trade Center. A chill ran down his spine. He ran to the TV room and saw the plot of his game playing out in real life. I felt I could no longer release this game. The Twin Towers are clearly visible throughout the game, even in the Polygon demo scene. We treated it as an iconic building. This was no longer a good idea. An emergency meeting was held the next day with an American lawyer to advise them, and they feared releasing the game could provoke the terrorists to attack Konami, especially Kojima and his team. They were afraid of the U.S. government, too, as Japanese news reported that ordinary citizens who criticized the Bush administration were losing their jobs and getting physically attacked. Sons of Liberty's villain was the president himself, and the script called him a terrorist. In Hollywood, war movies and action films with controversial themes were getting canceled left and right. Kojima wanted to follow suit. I personally thought MGS2 should not have been released. I even intended to quit the company. It was only two or three years of hard work, but his team strongly disagreed and pushed back, and Konami's top brass had their back. Ultimately, all decisions regarding the American version were taken out of Kojima's hands, and hundreds of pieces were surgically removed. The game released in America two months after the attack, and to Kojima's surprise, he only got one complaint about ideology. It turned out most fans were actually off that Raiden was the main character instead of Snake. That was the big controversy, which I kind of knew it would be at the time. Anyway, there were no terrorist or government attacks against Konami. Metal Gear Solid 2 went on to sell 7 million copies worldwide and achieved critical acclaim as one of the most culturally influential games of all time. After Sons of Liberty's massive success, Kojima wanted to do something that had never been done before, a realistic jungle. So he took his staff into the wilderness for a few days so they could build the game from personal experience, which turned into a life-threatening experience when some of them got lost. They were trained in CQC by combat specialists who threw them around, knocked them to the ground, and chopped them with dummy knives. I think I was thrown around 30 times, one developer recalls. Another said they hit him so hard he almost broke his bones. The climax of their training was when the MGS3 team split into three groups to sleep for the night. The combat specialists surrounded each group in the darkness, threatened their guard with a knife, and took him hostage. Then, Mach executed every last developer. After their school of hard knocks, Kojima's team threw out the MGS2 engine and built a brand new one from the ground up, specifically made for wilderness environments. They initially planned to use a dynamic weather system, so even if you stood in one place, the weather would change over time. 
but the mechanic was eventually cut, so in the game's final build, every area has predetermined weather patterns. In a case of making things a little too realistic, Kojima originally wanted the sniper battle with the end to last longer than the entire rest of the game. He thought Sniper Wolf was too game-like, as she only appeared in a few spots and the duel was over quickly, so Kojima aimed to make Snake Eater's sniper duel more true to life. In a 2005 magazine commentary, he said, I'm personally a fan of Stephen Hunter's novels, where you have scenes in the mountains where two snipers are hiding and trying to find each other for days. That's something I wanted to do in MGS3. So finally, I get these two characters in the mountains hiding, with the end trying to ambush Snake. When I explained what I wanted to do to my programmers, I made them read Hunter's books. We also went into the mountains and did some real training. My final direction to my guys was, if there are ten people that play this boss fight, I wouldn't mind if five of them hated it to the point of wanting to stop playing, as long as the other five fall in love with it. Which I did, by the way. Kojima wanted it to take one or two weeks of sneaking and sniping to finish the fight. Two weeks in real life. After Kojima's programmers finished building it, they sat down to test it out, but were playing for hours and hours and couldn't find the old man even once. The whole team hated it and started booing Kojima, who finally accepted his vision wasn't going to work. Then they changed it into a much easier and shorter affair, the boss battle we know today. Snake Eater has a variety of vehicle types, and mid-development, Kojima said players would probably get to operate at least some of them. Closer to release, Famitsu Weekly asked if Snake was going to be able to take control of aerial vehicles after he shot them down. Kojima said that was originally part of the plan, but realized it might break the game if Snake could fly everywhere, so they stopped working on that mechanic. In the game's final build, Snake can't operate any vehicles. There were a few ideas Kojima considered, but by the sounds of it, not as seriously as others. In that same Famitsu interview, Kojima said they thought about letting Snake take enemy weapons, which is pretty standard in first-person shooters, but decided not to because it'd make the game unbalanced. He also considered Snake using mud to cool himself to avoid heat detection, as well as jumping in rivers to make attack dogs lose his scent. Kojima said, in films and novels, dogs lose track of who they're chasing when that person goes across a river. In reality, I've been told that this is not the case. At this point, I am still contemplating whether I want to make it realistic or keep the fictional flavor. The mechanic didn't make it in, so apparently, he chose to side with reality. The MGS 1 through 4 art book shows a few unpublished characters, who appear to have gotten cut too early to be named, so they only got numbers, like the Medusa-themed number 2, the tiny-handed number 3, and number 7 and 8, who look like they'd be more at home in Silent Hill than Metal Gear. The book also shows some early sketches of characters who did make it into the game, like a pre-wheelchair eyepatch wearing The End. There's also a middle-aged version of The Fear, who the book notes has some African blood. Probably the weirdest concepts are for the pain, with one wearing a mask and another simply labeled Black Man Style. Then there's the boss, who's got a tattoo of a snake on her chest. According to Kojima, she was a mentor, a lover, and much like a mother to Snake. They had a very complicated connection, but I knew that I would have to emphasize the maternal aspect more than anything. So when designing the boss, I imagined a mother with one breast out feeding her child. A kind of mother-son nuance. So even with her breast exposed, she would enter battle. When I first designed her in the area around her chest, she had a tattoo of a snake. So when firing a gun, her breast would shake, making the snake look like it was laughing. There would be this legend that when you saw the laughing snake, your life would soon be over. But the tattoo and its backstory ultimately got cut, and replaced with a snake-shaped scar from a cesarean section she had while giving birth in World War II. The climactic ending with Snake and the Boss was revised as well. It seems this was a pretty late change, as the English voiceovers were already recorded. In the final game, these are her last words. There's only room for one boss and one snake. But, unused audio on the disc reveals it was originally going to play out a little differently, seemingly with the player in full control, able to move and aim at will, as the boss begs Snake to end her life. Shoot me. Come on. Shoot me. What are you waiting for? Just do it. Shoot me. What are you aiming at? I'm here. No. Shoot me. Do it right. What are you doing? Get it right this time. Ultimately, the player's freedom and all that begging got cut, and the player only has control over the trigger. After Snake Eater's development was almost wrapped up, a few changes were made between the Japanese and English versions. It was the first game in the series to drop an F-bomb, but only in Japan. It happens when Volgan calls Eva, his precious little pet, then she hits him with a big F-U. Here's the Japanese version. And 
here's the toned down English version. Do you have something to say to me? Go to hell! Later games weren't so shy about dropping F-bombs, but things were different back in the early 2000s. Post-release, a couple dozen new camo designs were made available for download. Most of them were eventually added into Subsistence and the HD edition, but four camos were only available in Japan, like the E-slash-Den camo, designed by manga artist Takayuki Mizushina to make Snake look like a hippie. Also, the New Year's camo, with a rising sun representing the Japanese concept of a New Year's beginning. And the Yodobashi camo, based on the Japanese retailer Yodobashi Camera Company. They were all included on a 2006 bonus disc distributed by the Japanese magazine Dengeki PS2. But the most difficult to obtain was the Wonder Goo camo. You had to go to a Japanese Wonder Goo store where they had a machine that uploaded the camo onto your PS2 memory card. None of these four camos were ever made available outside Japan. A year after Snake Eater, MGS3 Subsistence released and came with a new PvP mode called Metal Gear Online. Kojima originally wanted to include some girls from Dead or Alive as unlockable characters, but the producer of the wrestling series Rumble Roses asked if they could collaborate someday. Kojima would have preferred girls from Dead or Alive, but Rumble Roses was also owned by Konami, and he felt kind of obligated, so he added a couple Rumble Roses girls instead. If not for that, Metal Gear Online might have looked something like this. But arguably, the biggest piece of content was cut in 2012, when Snake Eater got a 3DS remake. It added a few new features like the camouflage photography system that let you take pictures in real life and turn them into custom camos. But in 2017, a data miner called Pliskin Hunter stumbled over an entire mode cut in development, Extra Ops. Peace Walker released a couple of years earlier and released 128 Extra Ops that were essentially VR missions, with objectives like eliminating every soldier in a given area, rescuing hostages, and getting from point A to point B with perfect stealth. Each mission only took a few minutes, but at the end, you got a ranking based on your performance, so there's a lot of replayability if you wanted to chase S ranks. What Pliskin Hunter discovered was 69 brand new extra ops that were intended for Snake Eater 3D. Yeah, 69. A fitting name for a game called Snake Eater. We got in touch with Pliskin Hunter, who was kind enough to share some info and rehack his game to get this footage. There were four ingredient capture operations, four animal captures, four eliminate enemy soldiers, four eliminate enemy in the time limit, four one-shots, five pantry demolitions, four armory demolitions, five perfect stealths, five true perfect stealths, four holdups, five claymore disarmaments, and five attack chopper battles. There were also 16 boss extensions, two each for Ocelot, the Pain, the Fear, the End, the Fury, Volgan, the Shagahod, and of course, the boss. With hacking, a lot of these extra ops are fully playable, but they're clearly unfinished. For example, there's no proper menu system, and when you complete a mission, you're immediately booted out with no fanfare. And instead of a ranking, there's just a placeholder that says, Result Test. If Extra Ops mode was finished, it would have added quite a few hours of extra content and done even more to make Snake Eater 3D the definitive MGS3 experience. Snake! What happened? Snake! Snake! Portable Ops follows Big Boss six years after the events of Snake Eater, but the game was initially conceived with a completely different premise. We recently spoke with Ryan Payton, who worked on the game, and he told us the original idea was a PSP game that let you relive the series' history through a gauntlet of boss battles. The game would have run on the subsistence engine and focused on local and online multiplayer. He said, those initial ideas probably only survived for a month or two in terms of it being more boss focused. This is just my interpretation of what was going on in those early days, which was, how do we create an authentic Metal Gear experience for PlayStation Portable that satisfies fans, perhaps more than the Acid series up to that point? And also, how do we get that game out the door fairly quickly? So the idea was to dust off existing boss battles and add some co-op elements to it as well. But those ideas didn't last very long, because we quickly pivoted towards what ended up becoming Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. After they changed the game's structure, Portable Ops was developed in just a single year, so there wasn't much time to ruminate on huge ideas. 
Also, Kojima wasn't as closely involved in the project, so compared to the rest of the series, there wasn't the deep well of ambitious concepts for us to detail here. But there were a few interesting regional differences. Portable Ops had a feature that required a GPS peripheral. The game told you to go to specific real-life coordinates, and there you'd be rewarded with special soldiers. Ryan told us how Kojima likes to make use of every feature offered by a console, and this geocaching mechanic was right up his alley. Unfortunately, the GPS was only released in Japan, so Western fans never had access to the feature. There were also eight soldier types you could only unlock by visiting Japanese stores like Wondergu, who'd worked out a promotional agreement with Konami. Metal Gear games usually released in Europe a few months after the US and Japan, so sometimes Konami gave them extra content to make up for it. For portable ops, European versions got a new boss rush mode, two more multiplayer maps, additional soldier types and careers, and five extra spy reports. So not only did America get less content than their friends across both oceans, but because of all the regional differences, nobody got the full experience. And with so many of those online features and promotions no longer in service, a big chunk of portable ops is completely inaccessible, and much of the game is essentially lost to time. What are you wearing? I, what do you mean? Why are you here? Oh, well, I was hoping to promote my new movie. I'm just coming off of the set. No, David Hayter. Why here, wearing an eye patch? For the franchise's big finale, Kojima dreamt even bigger than he had before and his early vision was completely different from the game that hit store shelves three years later. He said other PlayStation 3 games were just evolving the graphics, not the gameplay. Kojima wanted the next generation to push 3D into 4D, with a realistically recreated ecosystem. Every tree would grow from a seed, shed its leaves, and then die. There should be life in that tree. If we water the tree, it will grow. If we burn the tree, it will die. I want to create this kind of simulation world. He laid out his vision for Metal Gear Solid 4 in a lengthy interview in EGM. I would like to create something that we hadn't seen before. Up to today, creating games was almost like creating a set for the movies. You have the set in a studio, but a set is a set. There's nothing behind that, it's hollow. And also, everything is completely fake. It looks pretty, it looks like the real thing, but it actually isn't. Some creators might think, how can I expand my set and make it bigger? How can I make it a bigger world is what a typical creator would think. Even if you do that though, I think that's not meaningful because a set is a set. The trees are still plastic. Everything is still a fake. Although you try to enhance the look of the jungle, everything is a fake. I would like to go after the real. I would have the trees with life inside. So if you water the tree, it will grow. If you don't water the tree, it might die. Then I would ask the users, why not play hide and seek in that real jungle? A core theme he brought up again and again was creating what can't be seen. In short, while other studios were improving their games with next-gen graphics, Kojima was evolving the gameplay by focusing on the invisible. But those ambitious goals bear little resemblance to what MGS4 ultimately became. Looking back after release, G4 asked Kojima if his original vision was different to the final product. He said, there were differences from the beginning, when we started in the concept stage to the final product. But in the midst of development, when we saw the actual PS3 and its limits and things like that, we changed our vision and goals. At the beginning, we only heard rumors about the machine, that we could do anything on it that it was a monster machine, and so we set our dreams too high because we believed it could do anything. But when we saw the actual machine, of course, there are a lot of limits to it, and there were things we could do and could not do. It wasn't about the PS3's power, it was us dreaming too big. A couple more examples he described from that unrealized ecosystem was if you burn something, the chemicals affect other parts of the environment, or if water spilled on the grass, at some point a flower would bloom in that exact spot. Another core concept was Snake playing three nations against each other. We cover that concept pretty in-depth in our last video, so just to sum it up, Kojima said you could ally with countries A, B, or C, or go lone wolf. If two countries in a particular area were fighting each other, you could support one against the other to wipe them out, so only friendlies were left in the vicinity. Or you could just wait until both sides wiped each other out for sort of an easy mode. Play your cards wrong, and you'll have both of them against you. Hard mode. If one army gets destroyed, maybe they're missing from a later area they would have otherwise occupied. Whose side you were on was constantly changing based on your own decisions, which would have made the game highly replayable. Kojima also said the maps would be huge, the size of Grand Theft Auto environments, and full of all kinds of nooks and crannies, but they'd be much more fleshed out. He pointed to the houses in GTA, saying they're empty and lifeless, but in the new generation of Metal Gear, people actually lived in these houses. They had a life. Civilians and bystanders, he hinted, might even take up arms to protect their families. Another feature, touted as early as the very first trailer, was no place to hide. 
Kojima said they wanted to make most of the game world destructible, and in some areas pretty much anything could be destroyed. But in the final game, destruction was minimal and mostly pre-scripted. However, only shadows of those ideas made it into the final product. Kojima blamed the PS3's lack of power, and also said he regretted getting distracted with his management duties in the newly formed Kojima Productions, which at the time was developing Acid 2, Portable Ops, Portable Ops Plus, Metal Gear Online, and two digital graphic novels. He told Edge Magazine he wanted MGS4 to take 10 steps forward, but to his disappointment, it only managed to take one step forward. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay wasn't up to Kojima's standards either, but that was a matter of development talent rather than hardware restrictions. Just before MGS4 hit store shelves, he said, I thought Assassin's Creed was brilliant because it really fulfilled the basic concept that MGS4 had at the beginning, how you could go anywhere in the environment and also you could climb anywhere, run anywhere. At the beginning of the concept, Metal Gear Solid 4 had motion blending, meaning if you push down a direction, things go automatically and seamlessly. If a bullet comes, you don't have to manually dodge, but the motion dodges and happens naturally. We kind of gave up on this because it was just too difficult, but when Assassin's Creed came out, we saw that they accomplished what we were really aiming for at first. I have to tell you that my staff and I were really low for the next three days after it came out. Assassin's Creed was Kojima's favorite game there for a while, so much so that he eventually added Altair's cloak into Guns of the Patriots as a DLC. Those were the big ideas, but a few small ones got cut as well, like PS3 to PSP connectivity. At E3 2005, Kojima told interviewers that MGS4 would connect with Acid 2 in some way. He later said he wanted to connect with Portable Ops to trade soldiers between games, and was also considering letting players, maybe even a second player, control the Mark II with a PSP. Kojima tried to implement drivable vehicles in the previous game, and he was even more enthusiastic for them in Guns of the Patriots. He was a big fan of Halo 2, and pointed out that in all the popular games, players can drive pretty much anything, and yes, they were going to try and let Snake do the same in MGS4. None of those ideas made it in either. After release, Kojima told a Chinese magazine that they originally planned to include 108 weapons, but only ended up with around 70. 108 is a very specific number, especially since Kojima didn't seem to remember the exact number that actually made it in. 108 is also a culturally significant number, which might have been why it was the initial goal. At year's end in Japan, a bell's rung 108 times in Buddhist temples to close out the year and open the page on a new chapter. Each ring represents one of 108 earthly temptations a person has to overcome to achieve nirvana. And thus, the 108 weapons represent Snake's battlefield temptations, juxtaposed against the game's final message, to put aside the gun and live. Nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the f*** up! Okay, yes, I am speculating on the meaning, but Kojima did say they originally wanted Snake to have 108 weapons. In another interview, Kojima also said he was considering letting players trade weapon customizations with each other online, but that didn't make it in either. Another, more bizarre idea, which was probably never going to happen, was Kojima's desire to incorporate smell and even taste into his games. Before the 6-axis controller was revealed to the public, he told PSM Russia, If the PS3 comes with a controller that allows you to smell or taste things, that would be wonderful. I am interested in what new experience I can give to the user through all this. The problem is that most games limit you to using the TV and the console's joystick. Personally, I think this is a fundamentally flawed practice. Everything that surrounds the player in one way or another, his whole room even, should be involved in the process. He'd actually been talking about the idea as far back as MGS1, but even if he couldn't incorporate smell, he did make the player's room part of the game. Like switching the controller port in the fight against Psycho Mantis, and using the back of the real-life CD case to find a codec frequency. In fact, smell had been on Kojima's mind even before the first Metal Gear. In his 1988 game Snatcher, he wanted to coat the disc with blood-scented paint so when the console got hot it would melt and players could smell the murder scene. But up till now at least, he'd never been able to realize his decades-long dream of a smellable game. And of course, it wouldn't be Metal Gear without a little censorship. When asked if Snake's injections were a gameplay mechanic, Kojima said no. It has a little bit of friction against first-party Sony rules. At first, I had plans to have this injection as a player's item, but with the ratings and even team members questioning that direction, we decided not to do that. Apparently, Sony wouldn't tolerate performance-enhancing injections as a playable item, so they were downgraded to a plot device. At a signing event, Kojima revealed that the Beauty and the Beast cores were originally going to appear buck naked, and Yoji Shinkawa mentioned that in preparation, they had the actresses do motion capture in the nude, but they couldn't use it in the final game. There was also a subplot in the Naomi tracking sequence where enemy soldiers left a trail of women's clothes leading you in the wrong direction. At the end of the trail, you'd eventually find a naked female soldier, but that got cut as well. 
When we talked to Ryan Payton, he described a cut sequence intended to fit between the Big Mama motorcycle chase and running into Liquid. He said, There were some things that definitely fell on the cutting room floor, including a sequence in Eastern Europe. There was an underground tunnel sequence that players would go through with Big Mama as a kind of an escort scenario. That was cut fairly late in the process, so I always thought if there was ever a Metal Gear Solid 4 substance version, maybe the team would dust that off. It was probably 60 or 65% complete, and part of the reason it got cut was because it was behind schedule. You were escorting Big Mama in a callback to MGS3 when you were helping Eva, who was injured after a big motorcycle sequence. So here you were helping an injured Big Mama go through the underground after this big epic motorcycle chase as a callback. You can see the cut in real time when Snake and Big Mama crawl down a manhole into a tunnel, walk about 50 feet, and then turn right and they're already outside. The tunnel was originally a lot longer, and that's where the sequence took place. By the way, I'm David Hayter, the guy narrating this video. Some of you may not know, I was Snake's voice actor. We actually recorded about four minutes of dialogue for that sequence. Here's a few small pieces. Otacon, this place is crawling with rats. What, you were expecting a more vermin-free underground waterway? Something's weird about the way they're moving. First the birds helped me out in South America. Now it's the rat's turn. You've got to inject Big Mama with the nanomachine suppressant. Snake! What are you killing rats for? Torturing small animals is a sign of a warped mind, you know? Leave them alone and get back to helping Big Mama, all right? Ryan also told us that there were some ideas the staff had to cut due to time constraints, and as they were cutting them, the developers were saying, well, maybe this could get brought back in an eventual MGS4 substance version, like the tunnel sequence. And Ryan also talked about fleshing out moments that happen off screen, like what the Rat Patrol was doing behind the scenes in the Middle East. But after development was finished, the team shifted hard into Peace Walker and developing the Fox engine, so that definitive edition never got made. If it was up to Kojima, Raiden's hack and slash spin-off wouldn't have starred Raiden at all. I wanted to go for Frank Yeager or Gray Fox, but if we had gone with that, I would have had to write the script and then be really committed to creating the game. I want to pass game development to the younger generation in my team and have been trying to do so for quite some time. They wanted to come up with a really cool hack and slash title with some katana action and Raiden in it, and I thought, okay, that's fine, I respect that. A month after launch, Konami released a DLC pack made up of 30 new VR missions, but the Japanese version of the DLC gave fans something other regions didn't get. A wooden sword called Hebi Damashi, which means Snake Soul. Canonically, it was forged through the latest advancements in spiritual technology in order to pass on the wisdom of the legendary Solid Snake to future generations. Snake's Japanese voice actor, Akio Otsuka, recorded a new voiceover for it. And the sword talks to Raiden as he fights with it. If it had been localized into English, I guess it would have sounded something like this. Cardboard, huh? You get it, don't you, Raiden? It must be used with care. Devotion. You need to love the cardboard box. You can't just handle it roughly. No man who loves cardboard can be bad. This isn't training. This is life or death. There are no heroes out here. If you lose, you die for nothing. That sword was the only part of the DLC that didn't release outside Japan. And other than Snake's voice, it was functionally identical to the standard wooden sword available worldwide. So it seems the voice was probably the reason it didn't get localized, since it was only a few months before Ground Zeroes. I don't know for certain, but I can't tell you for a fact that I didn't record voiceover for it. And I don't remember ever being asked to either. It's been like 10 years though, so it's possible my memory is a little fuzzy. Y'all know I do stuff besides just voice Snake, right? I go buy wolves on DVD. <laughs> as far as Rising though, I guess you could say an entire game got cut. Metal Gear Solid Rising was scrapped almost entirely when Platinum Games took over and transformed it into Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. But did you know gaming will be covering Rising at some point, including some new information never made public? So we'll leave that topic for another time and move on to the final game discussed in today's video. Yeah, let's not do this one, actually. Five's already been done to death. Hey, guys. Let's do the wild geese thing. Yeah. Yeah, I know we said we weren't going to do that one. Let's do it anyway. Okay, cool. <clears throat> 
In 1978, a movie you've probably never heard of, The Wild Geese, released in theaters. Some mercenaries are hired to infiltrate a military base in Zimbala, Africa, and extract a political hostage so he can be exchanged for access to Zimbalan copper mines. The mercs are hired by a merchant banker, Sir Edward Matheson, who's sort of the movie's big boss. They halo jump into Zimbala, but they're vastly outnumbered, so they have to use stealth to silently kill the enemy soldiers. The mission's successful, but just as the mercenaries are about to make their escape, the big boss betrays them and is revealed to be the real villain. Their plane flies off without them, leaving the mercs totally screwed in the middle of nowhere. Hideo Kojima loves this movie, and the story appears to have inspired some elements of the Metal Gear franchise. The original 1987 Metal Gear was initially conceived as a game about a prisoner of war trying to escape, but during development, transformed into a game about special forces infiltration. In a series of tweets in 2011, Kojima revealed that at that point in time, he wanted to make Metal Gear into a team infiltration game just like the Wild Geese. But the MSX wasn't capable of making Kojima's idea into reality, so he had no choice but to make Metal Gear a one-man-against-the-world affair instead. If the MSX was a little more powerful, or if Metal Gear was made for different hardware, it would have been a completely different kind of game, and consequently, the entire series would have been different. For the past 35 years, underpowered hardwares prevented Kojima from making Metal Gear games he dreamed of making. But from the very beginning, we have underpowered hardware to thank for giving us the Metal Gear franchise as we know it today.